Welcome to Securing America with me, Frank Gaffney, a program that we think of as a kind of owner's manual for protecting the country we love against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I'm very pleased to have with us to begin a conversation about some of those enemies, a man who, well, for some time was arguably in the enemy camp. He was a Marxist professor at the University uh, of New York, New York University, and has come a long way, baby, um, in the aftermath of having had the left turn on him and has become really one of the most, I think, articulate and clear-eyed critics of what the Marxists amongst us are up to. I want to commend to you all an absolutely superb example of Dr. Michael Rechtenwald's work that appeared in the publication of Hillsdale College called Imprimis Magazine. Dr. Rechtenwald, thank you for joining us. <clears throat> Congratulations on this uh, print that goes out to several millions of Americans and uh, for the chance to have a chance, to, well, the opportunity to visit with you further about it all. Um, talk a little bit, if you would, about your personal trajectory and uh, the extent of the danger you think we face at the moment. Yes. Well, you know, when I first encountered the social justice ju uh, uh, zealots at NYU, I was really a Marxist at that point. And uh, uh, developments there and their, their uh, character really uh, took me by surprise and also changed my trajectory. Um, I realized what I was dealing with was uh, a totalitarianism uh, at base and that, you know, these people were extremely um, dangerous, in fact, in effect, that we were dealing with something that if it spread beyond the university would become uh, an evil that we would have to that we would have to take uh, care of, that we would have to deal with. And in fact, you know, it has spread uh, beyond the academy. I think it did originate there, and now it, it metastasized to the entire body politic. And so I think we're dealing with uh, systemic evil, really. I couldn't agree more. Um, let's talk a little bit about that evil in the context of uh, what, as you've described in this essay, um, is the so-called Great Reset um, its character is something that it seems is a, a function of a, an unholy alliance between Marxists on the one hand and at least putative uh, global capitalists. Um, tell us what they've got in mind and uh, how far advanced it is, as you see it. Yes. Well, the Great Reset is a project that was initiated by the World Economic Forum uh, and Klaus Schwab, the chair and founder of it, uh, it is a project to fundamentally alter our economic and political and social uh, system. Uh, so what we're looking at is a fundamental change in the nature of capitalism, as they say, a reset of capitalism. And really what it involves is this alliance between uh, the World Economic Forum uh, corporations, some thousand corporate partners, uh, plus the UN and various governments throughout the world. So they're using, of course, very euphemistic and innocuous sounding language in order to inaugurate what we what would be a fundamental change uh, to the entire economic and world system. Uh, they suggest that it's uh, necessary on the basis of climate change. Uh, they say this is all for sustainability, but really there is a command principle at, at base, and that is this is they are dictating to people, uh, companies, and individuals what they must do, and they are effectively uh, aligning with states as well with governments, and uh, in effect they're allowing this corporate state partnership uh, to dictate policy that is not democratically decided upon whatsoever. So it really is quite uh, authoritarian. And this is, this is where I guess you see the convergence between 
the 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 left on the one hand, um, the communists, in the case of China specifically, for whom these uh, Davos guys seem to have considerable admiration in terms of their their model, um, and yet. Uh, yes. The the capitalist dimension of it, I guess, makes uh, more of a fascistic sort of uh, arrangement they have in mind. But whatever it is, it's bad for freedom. That's for sure. And That's uh, right. again, your standing against it is is really appreciated, uh, Dr. Reckonwald. Um, let me ask you about um, one of the things that I found striking uh, from a government that has been increasingly, it seems, enamored of all of this. Uh, namely, uh, the administration of Joe Biden here in the United States. As you know, he gave a speech um, widely billed as the State of the Union. I describe it as the the gaslight of the Union, because so much of it seemed uh, quite deceptive, dishonest, uh, at least deflecting of attention from the real track record to something very different. How did you see this as a perhaps... um, exercise in the kind of uh, political warfare that you've described. Yes, this was a, as you put it, this was a, a, a massive gaslighting uh, episode and uh, a, a, an, a, an exemplary uh, case of doublespeak in which uh, Biden was basically uh, suggesting that all the problems that were attendant upon the country now, like the immigration problem, uh, the uh, production problem, the supply chain problem, uh, the uh, inflation problem, that these were all based on policies that had nothing to do with him. In the crimes in the streets, just outrageous crime and criminality. He's suggesting that, you know, uh, you know, we need to Fix, you know, we need to fix the border as if he hasn't been the one responsible for actually uh, opening the border to this uh, complete onslaught of immigrants without vetting whatsoever. Uh, so, I mean, it was the most outrageous doublespeak I've seen, and it really is part and parcel of what a, a pathocracy or dictatorship by psychopaths, frankly, uh, is, is, uh, characterized by. They're characterized by these kinds of gaslighting, doublespeak, and uh, complete inversions of reality. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Rechtenwald, we only have a couple of minutes left, but uh, when you look at this from the perspective of someone who has been inside the belly of this particular beast, who understands its agenda, and who is really very concerned about clearly its continuing progress towards realizing some of its ambitions, if not all of them, to dominate and control the rest of us. What are your most important recommendations about what we do now to counteract all this? Well, yeah, I think that first of all, we need to resist this uh, this kind of uh, euphemistic language that's being put out about environmental, social, and governance scores, and, you know, the ESG index, which is being applied to corporations in the stock markets, but which will be applied to us as individuals soon enough. Uh, We need to point out its character necessarily. We need to show how it is totalitarian at base. We need to keep the free market alive ourselves by engaging in uh, parallel structures that of exchange, uh, parallel uh, economic, parallel media structures like this. We need to keep these and strengthen and fortify them uh, and extend them as much as possible. And we need to resist these we have to leave it at that. Scores. Dr. Reckonwald, thank you for your very important insights in this. And we look forward to further updates with you in the future. Keep up the great work, my friend. Come back to us again soon. Next up, we will be speaking with another former leftist, about the efforts to take us down from within.
Welcome back, and a very special welcome to our next guest. Her name is Carrie Donovan. She has experience, like Dr. Michael Rechtenwald, with the left. She was, in fact, a community organizer, much as Barack Obama was back in the day. As a result, she has real insights into the nature of what the left is up to, and in particular, wanted to talk a little bit about something that, uh, well, President Biden tried to persuade us, uh, gaslight us, I think, was his true position on the police, which is that they should be funded, not defunded. Uh, Carrie, it's great to have you with us. Um, talk a little bit about what your investigations of the left's true intentions are with respect to the police, and um, in particular, a manual that you have found to be pretty illuminating about this and perhaps about what Joe Biden is up to specifically. Thanks so much, Frank, for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you about this because I've been trying to get the message out for a long time. I was a community organizer. I worked with U.S. Congressman Howard Wolpe, who was working in the subcommittee for Africa with Jesse Jackson. That's when I really started to learn about the left's plans for the United States was basically uh, what they were doing back starting in 1979 in South Africa. We know how that has, you know, how that has transpired and what's happened, the consequences. Um, in particular, I, I think that this particular manual, which you made reference to, and it's 146 pages, I think that this manual, which I found about five years ago, explains a lot about what the left is doing. And to me, this particular manual explains the grassroots marketing platform, messaging, branding, and PR. A, a lot of the narrative setting um, that the left has accomplished through the years. Um, and I like how you said that so you know, Joe Biden- So this is entitled Organized for Change. Uh, and yes. and what it basically does is, is sort of provide a playbook for efforts like this concerning the police. And is it about funding the police or is it about no. actually trying to dismantle them? So this particular manual is a step-by-step -step guide on how to go into local community police departments and defund them using all of the left's, ta left's tactics that they are very well known for. Um, this manual. Give us some examples of them. So in this manual, it, it tells uh, activists, so regular people, how to use the media to to set the narrative, to set the tone by going and finding somebody who's had a bad experience with the police. So we know that from what happened with Trayvon Martin, that's how Black Lives Matter developed. And this manual, which goes back to 2014 and was written by Kamala Harris's sister, Maya Harris, uh, what is, tells them how to take and exploit a situation and use the media, run with it, form the narrative, and then go in, get voters. There's a particular um, section here on how to get swing voters. So they're focused on elections and using these tactics to change everything. And so the defund the police movement has been around for a very long time. I found reference to things in this manual from 2001 that say this movement goes back a long way. So when Joe Biden says that he's going to fund the police, well, he would be making a, a massive break with his vice president, Kamala Harris, because as I said, her sister wrote this particular manual right here, which is a policy link. And Joe Biden already has funded policy link um, organizations. So he is connected to this manual and to the movement. Carrie, mm -hmm. uh, let me just say, Kamala Harris, of course, was very forthright during the presidential campaign um, about her support for Black Lives Matter, for, um, well, the rioters uh, that were taking uh, cities by storm across the United States. Uh, and as I recall, she was very explicitly in favor of this defunding the police initiative, much as her sister has been. Um, just the bottom line, if you would, what is it that they envision happening when they defund the police? What is the larger objective of the left in which this is uh, being put into the service? Yeah, that's a great question. So 
in general, what the left wants is that the left claims that the U.S. Constitution doesn't provide um, equity or equality to their special groups, which is why they have all these different identity groups. What is it that they want? Well, they exploit nonprofits. So they get a lot of money. So they want to make money and then they want to change our, our republic into a democracy or, you know, rule by mob. And this is how they set out to do it. Basically, defunding the police, right, is taking away the police is a great way to get that, that environment where they can really make a lot of strides in these uh, changes that they want. Yeah. So we've seen the effects of this in quite a number of cities across the country, this uh, this defunding or dismantling or retraining or repurposing or whatever you want to describe it as. And I think it's been a decided disaster for those communities. Uh, and it's my sense that that's precisely why President Biden, of course, is now trying to position himself in the State of the Union, at least, as being in favor of funding the police instead. To what extent, and we talked a little bit about this a moment ago with Dr. Recknewald, but in your experience with the left as a community organizer, to what extent is it really important for them to be clear among their own cohort, of course, about what they're doing, witness this manual, but to be opaque wherever possible, to, to be deceptive uh, towards the rest of the American people so as to conceal their true purposes and uh, the upshot of them. Yeah, you hit you hit it, the target right on the head, and you called it gaslighting. They they are gaslighting us because they tell us what they think we want to hear, so that we will let our guard down, so that we will not be vigilant over our liberty, so that we will not push back on them. So they tell us things to comfort us and soothe us. In the meantime, in the back room, the smoky back rooms, they're doing exactly what they've always done, and that is what the left is very very good at. They message brand. They use messaging, branding, and PR to tell us what we want to hear, so that we are fighting amongst ourselves about you know what they could possibly be up to. And in the meantime, this the the word is out. They all know. They all have agreed with each other that this is a war against the American Republic. This is a usurpation of our rights and the U.S. Constitution. They've agreed upon it. They're mourning tonight you know, political activists, and they know that whatever is being said has not been changed. It's just to get us going in a different direction. This is uh, obviously conducive to success if they've thrown us off the scent and we're either fighting amongst ourselves over, for example, um, you know, are we a systemically racist nation or not, um, while they are beavering away at, at what Barack Obama famously called the fundamental transformation of America. And, and very quickly, just in a minute or so, Kerry Donovan, what is it that that fundamental transformation would entail? if it were successful, not, not just at the sort of micro level of the police, but uh, the macro level, if you will. Right. Well, my fear has always been since going back to working with Jesse Jackson, what, what really alarmed me was the, um, the chaos. And if you look at South Africa, which I think is the model that the Democrats want to usher in to the United States, that there's chaos among the people while the elite are getting rich off of the natural resources in South Africa. So that really frightened me when I was a community organizer and I was a social worker and went into social work to help people. And when I realized what you're doing is making more of a mess and endangering people and, and actually stealing their liberty away from them, that's when I got scared and I said, this is not for me. But I think that the, the ultimate goal of the left is to basically usher in what we see happening in South Africa. Which is a disaster for one of the most important and once prosperous uh, nations on that continent. And it would similarly, I think it's fair to say, be a disaster for the United States of America and for that matter, for the free world. Terry Donovan, we commend you for your uh, coming around on all of this and for the courage you're exhibiting in coming forward and talking about what the true agenda is and why it is so antithetical to the interest of the United States and its people.
Welcome back, and a very special welcome to our next guest. Her name is Dr. Carol Swain. She is an extraordinarily accomplished woman with a really remarkable life story. She has been a professor at some of the best universities in the United States. She's an author. She's a blogger. She is a, well, a resource, I think, for all of us who care about freedom and the character of our country, as well as... Um, the character of, of our polity. She has been active in particular in opposition to efforts to assert that this is a racist nation, one that has been systematically so. Uh, she points to her own life experiences as uh, indicative of the fact that that is not the case. Um, she was the woman that I was hoping that President Biden had in mind when he said he was going to pick a black woman to become the next uh, Supreme Court justice. Um, alas, he chose someone else, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson. And I wanted to talk with Carol as a very accomplished, as I say, um, attorney and law professor to evaluate uh, not just this nomination, but the process by which it was made. Carol Swain, welcome back to Securing America. It's great to have you with us. Uh, I can tell you that when I was on the job market as a um, young PhD, I refused to apply to positions that were minority only where I would have competed just against other black people. And so I find it um, offensive, but also believe it's unconstitutional for President Biden to limit competition to one category of people, not even including, uh, I mean, just the whole idea that he believes that the only way you could get a qualified black woman on the Supreme Court was to limit competition to black women, uh, that's ludicrous. And it's also unconstitutional. I believe it runs counter to our civil rights laws. And it's problematic that she's going to be voting on, if confirmed, uh, an affirmative action case and a voting rights case. No, I think this is such an important point, and and uh, it, it seems as though, especially if one takes to heart, uh, you know, Martin Luther King's admonitions about uh, the quality of your character being what you're judged by, not the color of your skin. Uh, this is uh, this is a, really an abomination, as well as uh, as you say, I think a, a constitutionally problematic um, practice. Uh, let's talk about this nominee, though, and, and what um, you've expressed some concerns about her background and uh, associations that uh, should be disqualifying. It seems well, first to me. of all, she is the pick of the progressive left, the, the far left. And on the uh, committee that selected her uh, was a board member of Black Lives Matter. And we know they stand for defunding uh, the police. Uh, they stand for a lot of things that many of us would consider anti-American. But she, um, the person, uh, a high-profile person from Black Lives Matter, was part of that committee. And the progressives, uh, they were the ones that hounded Justice Breyer until he uh, uh, decided to resign, retire uh, early. And um, with Judge Katanja Brown Jackson, what you get is a person who uh, she uh, checks the right boxes. She has her Harvard degree. And I personally believe that we have too many people on the court with Ivy League degrees. They have disappointed us again and again. And I don't care whether they're liberals or conservatives. They're indoctrinated in such a way that they don't necessarily uh, adhere to the Constitution. Uh, they are always elitist. I would prefer to see people from a wider range of law schools. So that's one issue that I would have personally, but this particular justice, it's, she um, uh, believes in partial birth abortion. Uh, I mean, she uh, is as radical, I would say, as you can get. And then she um, also has not, she's been overruled on two opinions. And it's my understanding that she's only authored one majority opinion where she uh, actually wrote the opinion. I would have preferred. Yeah. She's she's relatively new to the bench too, as I recall. She's only been on uh, in the appellate court in uh, in 
the past year, right. as I understand it. So this is not a long judicial track record. Well, apparently, uh, President Biden, in yes. his uh, so-called State of the Union address, suggested that she was one of the great uh, legal minds of our time. Um, does your assessment of her track well, with I mean, that or she, not? Um, uh, you know, she has uh, served... Um, in on lower courts a, a longer period of time there's no evidence that she's a great judicial mind and if competition was going to be limited to black women which i don't believe that it should have been done because it was unconstitutional he could have nominated the black woman uh, i would have preferred um, judge childers from um judge Childs, i believe from south carolina or the justice from um, California, uh, Lenora Kruger, I believe is her name, uh, one of those. But at the end of the day, it's very problematic how he selected this nominee. And I hope that Republicans, the three that voted for her confirmation last time, that they will not use that or pass votes for her as a reason to say that they have to do it again. No, you don't have to do it again because a Supreme Court um, a, a nomination and confirmation that has lasting consequences. And so you're not just getting, you know, a, a black woman or a black face, you're getting a far left progressive that will push an agenda that is not pro-American. And we know with Black Lives Matter, they have Marxist roots. And so there's no reason to believe, given this woman's positions, that she isn't also someone who would lean towards Marxism and socialism. Yeah. Um, you mentioned some of the cases before the court. Um, this is a moment when uh, you've been very actively involved in trying to counter uh, the left's uh, rewriting of our national history, uh, notably with the 1619 Project. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the sort of context in which this uh, judicial appointment is going to be making these uh, decisions. Um, is that the kind of agenda that you anticipate she would be trying to advance as well, this sort of radical assertion that uh, this well, is a racist at, uh, country? Since uh, George Floyd's uh, death, uh, the, uh, you know, the, the one thing we had the situation of millions of dollars, over $60 million going into Black Lives Matter. We don't know where that money is uh, today, but the diversity, equity, and inclusion industry, critical race theory, it has pretty much taken over the nation, even though the law of the land says that we are not supposed to engage in discrimination, that the law says uh, that uh, is, the law supports anti-discrimination and equal accommodations. It does not support the radical agenda that's being pushed and being accepted at many institutions and including our government. And I think that um, she would certainly advance that agenda. And I have been very uh, involved. As you know, I authored a book last year uh, that was written to educate the public called Black Eye for America, How Critical Race Theory is Burning Down the House. And critical race theory uh, is something that it just runs counter to our civil rights laws and to our constitution and who we are as Americans. And I believe that there's no evidence that this particular um, nominee would support the Constitution, uh, uh, Constitution's Equal Protection Clause I believe she would pursue an agenda that would be more akin to Black Lives Matter, the people that want to defund the police and empty the prisons. And I don't believe that when it comes to crime, that she would have a concern about that. She seems to be more concerned about criminals than about the victims. This is a deeply troubling indictment, really, of, of uh, you know, sort of certainly her past uh, record and, uh, and associations and you know, anticipating where she might go from here. Um, on the critical race theory piece, we've been talking in the course of the program to this point, Carol, with several former leftists about the agenda. And are you very clear about the character of this critical race theory? Is it, as I believe, a Marxist agenda 
designed to divide us against one another and essentially take down anyone that says that critical race theory is not being taught in K through 12 uh, schools that they are lying. And if you go to Black Lives Matter, they had a week of action for schools. What they have done is to take those ideas, those ideas that are related to Marxism and postmodernism, and they have distilled it into children's books for K through 12. And sometimes those books don't go home with the children, but they're in children's books. And so it is everywhere. And I maintain that as it is being practiced, even with the sensitivity training, that it runs counter to the civil rights laws because they prohibit discrimination against people on the basis of their race, color, nationality, uh, sex, uh, and religion. And we know that uh, some of the things that are taking place, not only does it seem to infringe, um, uh, it violates the civil rights laws, but also the equal protection clause, and pr probably in many cases, the First Amendment, because it, it compels people under threat of losing their job or being kicked out of school or some organization to uh, voice and, and affirm certain things that they don't believe uh, about themselves and their racial and ethnic group. And oh, about yes, our I mean, country, yes. too, needless to say. <laughs> Dr. Carol Swain, we, we have to leave it at that. We've got so much more to talk about. I hope that you'll come back to us again very soon. In the meantime, thank you for your clear-eyed leadership and your courage in tackling these very important topics, including that of the next Supreme Court nominee. We'll look forward to seeing how this plays out and your role in it. We're back, and we are thrilled to have one of our favorite guests with us for the concluding two blocks of this program to talk in some detail about what is happening in Ukraine, why it's happening, and what its implications are going to be, not just, again, for the people there, but for us as well. And, needless to say, what is the rest of the world going to do about all of this? His name is J.R. Nyquist. He's one of the most brilliant strategic analysts I know. He is the author of uh, The Third World War. He is also a contributor to, among other places, Epic Times. And his own web blog, um, jrnyquist.blog. Jeff, it is great to have you back. Thank you for taking the time to talk with us about this surpassingly important well, invasion that is underway at the moment at uh, Vladimir Putin's instigation in Ukraine. Give us your sort of situation report, if you would, on what's happening there at the moment as we speak. The Russians are only able to invade slowly because the ground is a soft ground mud condition and the air is overcast, so it's not ideal for offensive operations, which is very unusual. The second half of February was supposed to be frozen, but the cold air went into North America instead of Russia. Um, right now, they have flanked the Ukrainian line in the east. They have surrounded Mariupol, which is the southern part of that line. Um, I understand that the water and the electricity have been cut off, and I, I would expect the forces there to try to break out and get away. It's very difficult for the same reason it is difficult for the Russians to advance. It's difficult for the Ukrainians to retreat. And of course, they're also trying to surround Kiev, and there will probably be uh, an amphibious invasion near Odessa. And they are going for the whole country. Uh, and they are using very brutal means because it is mud. They can't maneuver. They're using rockets. They're using artillery. They're bombarding their way. Yeah. And when you talk about they, you're obviously talking about uh, the Russian right. army. And to the extent that it is engaged in this kind of wholesale campaign against the entirety of the country, uh, Jeff, are you anticipating that as they get close to and uh, try to take these various cities, uh, whether it's Mariupol or um, Kiev or for that matter, uh, that they're going to um, decide not to engage in urban, you know, house to house, block to block 
fighting, but uh, simply lay waste to these well, cities. Well, in Chechnya, they did something similar to this. They have the vacuum bombs, the thermobaric bombs. Perhaps you know the Ukrainian ambassador to the U.S. has accused them of using ther- thermobaric bombs, and it's it's really has the effect of a tactical nuclear weapon, but it's non-nuclear. It is prohibited by treaty. Um, but I, I don't think the Russians care. They've always done that sort of thing. Uh, they do want to minimize their casualties, and they've had pretty high casualties so far for what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, I would expect the worst there. They're trying to break the back of Ukraine, essentially. Are you surprised that it's taken this long for them to accomplish no, that? No, I'm not, because I, kn- I know about the bad ground conditions and attacking along narrow road axis. This is what you would expect to see. And any military professional in the Russian army would have expected to see it. This is the extraordinary thing that the Kremlin made a conscious choice to attack in these uh, non-optimal conditions, which suggests to me that something else is going on that he has made a commitment, that he is on a timetable, and that it doesn't matter to him whether this goes fast or slow, as long as he keeps to his commitment, whatever it is in its timetable, and that commitment may be to the Chinese. Uh, we're going to talk about the Chinese uh, after a short break here in just a moment, Jeff, but uh, Putin, I'm told, may have been encouraged to believe that he could attack uh, a minor incursion, for sure, we know about. Uh, Joe Biden alluded to that. Uh, but uh, a woman by the name of uh, Victoria Nuland, uh, Under Secretary of State, I gather, made a trip to Moscow in uh, October of last year and may have, uh, like uh, a notorious ambassador, April Glaspie, uh, in Iraq on the eve of the invasion of uh, Kuwait by Saddam Hussein, Uh, similarly signaled that uh, we wouldn't um, interfere with uh, such action uh, by Putin, in this case, against Ukraine. Have you heard anything to that effect, and uh, do you credit it? I I wouldn't think it mattered because, uh, look, this isn't a minor incursion. They're going for the whole country. And when that ground dries, Mm -hmm. they're going to go for Western Ukraine. Jeff Nyquist, uh, there is a lot of speculation at the moment that the Russians are losing in this uh, invasion and uh, the conflict that has been precipitated by it. Um, How do you assess that situation? As long as their morale holds and their leadership is firm, they're going to win because they've basically flanked the Ukrainians. Uh, All this speculation, you know, they focus on individual uh, engagements, uh, captured Russian soldiers. This is not really indicative. What is a Russian soldier going to do when he's captured? And they also talk about the looting of the stores, Look, that's a good strategy to have your soldiers forage. Armies have foraged for years. It doesn't mean that they maybe didn't plan to have their soldiers taking food. Um, So we have to be careful, a little bit skeptical about these kind of reports. But of course, you know, attacking in this weather, the Russian soldiers cannot be happy about the situation themselves. Yeah. And they have had considerable logistical problems, I think it's fair to say, uh, whether they were planning on foraging or not. Jeff, very quickly, there's another issue here, and that is that the United States has been, um, as we've discussed, uh, not in the lead so much. Uh, The Europeans have seemingly coalesced around a fairly robust line vis-a-vis the Russians. Were you surprised at that? Do you think it'll stand up? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, Like I say, I think that... um, The Ukrainian fronts, uh, especially in the western part of the country, are likely to hold and expand and grow until the ground dries. And the ground isn't going to be reliably dry until May or June. Hmm. So we'll see this playing out over time uh, unless and until the Russians are able to strangle the major cities and uh, decapitate the government, which certainly seems to be their purpose. Uh, Jeff Nyquist, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, I want to develop with you further, uh, if we can, um, the situation on the ground in, in Ukraine, but most especially how it may be tying into a larger strategy in which Vladimir Putin is engaged with his friends in communist China, uh, Xi Jinping and his agenda vis-a-vis Taiwan, among other things. That and more right after this.
Welcome back. We're continuing our conversation with Jeff Nyquist, a very serious strategic analyst and a guy who's been following very closely what is happening in Ukraine, among other places. And Jeff, you were just saying that um, the calculation that Putin made um, may not have been a function of the sense that uh, the United States and presumably the rest of the West would uh, have no particular problem if he went into Ukraine. Finish that well, thought if you want. Uh, Russia, given the economic uh, sanctions that they could have expected, and also the opposition and the future trouble, they could only have contemplated doing this if they had some kind of deal with the China Chinese. China is an extremely powerful economy. This can support them economically. They have allies in Iran, Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, other places in Africa. But China is the one that can give them the support. Now, what are the Chinese getting if they give the support? The Chinese have their own aggressive objectives. They've built the biggest Navy in terms of the number of warships in the world. And March is a very good time of year for naval operations in the Western Pacific. It just happens. So I'm asking the question, did this happen in February, despite the bad ground conditions, because the Russians have made a commitment to the Chinese and the Chinese have their own plan for aggressive action this month. That sounds right to me, Jeff, I have to say. Uh, so the idea would have been that there was a distraction by the Russians, uh, get everybody focused on Europe, um, on Ukraine specifically, um, embroil uh, the international organizations and uh, the rest of the hand ringers on that subject. And meanwhile, uh, the main action is going to come against Taiwan in the form of uh, an actual attack by the well, Chinese. Well, you know that reckon? Taiwan is more likely to be defended by Japan and the United States than Ukraine would be by NATO. And so it was a safe bet, I think, for Putin, as long as he made lots of threats like the nuclear war threat. Plus, you have the flagship of the Northern Fleet and the Pacific Fleet in the Mediterranean, strong task force that have to be watched by us. So we have naval... Yeah, this is Russia, the Russian... Northern Fleet and Pacific Fleets are in the Med, and they're tying up our ships. They're tying up troops that were sent to Eastern Europe to watch this situation at the border, that it doesn't spill over. They even, the Russians, even accidentally on purpose, I think, on purpose, through the president of uh, uh, Belarus, Lukashenko, released a map showing that the Baltic states and Moldova are next. In, in line. So this is causing us indeed to concentrate on Russia and air assets too. So that makes the Pacific more of a, a vulnerable spot to be next. Yeah. Uh, it, interestingly, it seems to me that one of the things that might prompt all of those assets being in the Eastern Mediterranean is Russia's determination to try to protect its uh, its allies there, uh, Syria and Iran, imperfect though they may be, uh, from uh, an action by Israel, which uh, is seemingly increasingly involved they have, as well. Yeah. But just coming back to China, Jeff, if the Chinese have decided uh, not simply to um, try to coerce Taiwan into submission or envelop it, uh, perhaps even by uh, doing some movements uh, to uh, sort of encircle them with uh, Philippine territory being seized. Uh, is it your estimation at this point that sometime within the next few days, perhaps, or certainly weeks in March, that the Chinese will mount an amphibious operation against Taiwan? It is Taiwan? possible. They have massed the troops for an amphibious operation. Uh, but I, I must say the Chinese leaders may be risk averse to an amphibious invasion and they may prefer a blockade. And the reason that, that the good weather is important is that, you know, you can run a blockade in bad weather. So it may be a blockade and maybe they'll invade if the blockade is not working fast enough. I don't know, but it, I would think they would do a blockade first because of, you know, watching them. They don't like to be defeated or perceived to be weak or losing. And a blockade is less risky. Would you anticipate, uh, Jeff, did, did you say that they are massing they, troops? They, for they were massing troops. They've been ma point? putting troops opposite Taiwan here since the pandemic started about. They started doing this and talking about invading in uh, April of 2020, that war was coming. 
and that they alerted the army. And they uh, they indicated, as I understand it, uh, during the roughly the time the president was doing his so called State of the Union address, that they were uh, there was nothing that the United States could do uh, about um, Taiwan. And the clear implication is that they uh, they've set their sights on demonstrating that. So, Jeff Nyquist, let me just ask you in closing: um, when you look at this situation, uh, whether it's in Ukraine, whether it's in the Eastern Mediterranean, whether it's in um, China's uh, backyard, uh, Taiwan, and so on, um, are we at the cusp of possibly a global conflict, uh, World War Three? Seeing the reaction in Europe and in the U.S., I think we are. I think that the emotions are running high, seeing people being destroyed and countries being destroyed on this scale. I don't think the West can stop itself from wanting to intervene. And these powers have made a commitment to uh, push out. So I think the combination of the two, I think at some point a, a, a world war, a major war between major powers is now inevitable. Wow. And Jeff, um, one of the things that Vladimir Putin has done, as you know, in just the past few days in response in part to the Europeans' retaliation against him for the invasion of Ukraine has been to raise the alert level on his uh, nuclear forces. Um, There have actually been some statements to the effect that uh, if there is a world war, it will be a nuclear one as well. Um, Do you anticipate that that's what we're looking at? Should it go? Yeah, the Russian military doctrine is to go immediately over to nukes if there's a world war. Um, the Putin, that was one of the first things Putin did when he became president 22 years ago, is he adopted that doctrine. So I'm afraid it's, it doesn't look good. You know, I mean, I don't know how they're going to avoid a war. Uh, Russia and China seem determined to push out. Um, you look at Iran is about ready to break out with their nuclear weapons in a matter of weeks, I'm told. Right. And that may be why that Russian fleet is there leaning on Israel. So, Indeed, I think it is. And uh, certainly why Israel's uh, level of uh, activity is, seems to be intensifying as well. Jeff Nyquist, these are grim tidings. Um, needless to say, I, I think we both hope you're wrong. I fear you may be right. And in any event, it's why we're here, is to cover these kinds of stories and take them where they lead. We'll look forward to visiting with you again in the near future for that purpose. I want to thank the rest of you for being with us for this edition of Securing America. 